The second uh, group of proteins that we're going to talk about for case study is very different from the opsins. Uh, so as we begin doing this, um, I'd like to do a little bit of defining, laying some groundwork. We'll talk a little bit again about the morphological side, and then we'll look at some of the patterns that we see on the molecular side. So we're going to be looking at a group of proteins that are all used as venoms. So I want to just be very clear well, what we mean when we say a venom. Now, venom is a toxic substance that is used to be injected in either offensively or defensively into another organism. Uh, and so there can actually be kind of a wide range. Many of them we think of as this typical uh, predator-prey interaction where the venom is used to subdue prey before uh, consuming it. But there are other options also and other things that, that venoms can be used for. There's some interesting ones with the parasitoid wasps where we have an injection of a toxin that helps to break down part of the tissue prior to oviposition. Um, and so there are some other interesting things. And so venom is any uh, substance, most of them are proteins, that has a toxic impact when it's injected into another organism. Now, we see venoms across a wide range of organisms, but for the majority of what we're going to be doing here, we're going to be focusing on the venoms of snakes and lizards. So we'll define that group and talk about the phylogeny of that group in a little bit, but I also like then to, to define this term venome and proteome. So we've already talked about genomes. That should be a very uh, easy definition for you. We, in a other discussion, we'll talk about uh, transcriptomes, right? So you should know what a transcriptome is. So the genome is all of the DNA in an organism. The transcriptome is only the DNA that is being expressed and used, that is being transcribed and translated into proteins. And then the proteome is the resulting protein product of that transcriptome. And there's not a one-to-one -one ratio between a transcriptome and a proteome all the time because some things are transcribed multiple copies from a single transcript. Sometimes there can be differential splicing of a transcript to result in different outcomes. Sometimes the, the proteins interact together, form quaternary structures. And so there's a little bit more detail. Although genomes create transcriptomes, transcriptomes create proteomes, at each level there's a different level of complexity that we're looking at and different factors that we need to consider. So proteome would be all of the functional proteins that are um, present in a tissue sample or in an organism uh, or at a, a certain stage of development or something like that. And so the venome is the subcategory of the proteome that is used as this uh, toxic uh, injection, this toxic weapon, okay? So, here is a phylogeny of major lizard groups. Now, I say lizard groups, and I'm leaving out snakes or the serpentes because just as birds are just very highly specialized dinosaurs, the snakes, it turns out, are just very highly specialized lizards. So if we classify lizards as a separate group from snakes, it's not valid because it renders the lizards paraphyletic. Notice that there are some species of lizards, these ones that include the helodermatids, anguids, varanids, iguanas. So that group of lizards right there is more closely related to the snakes than the others. And this is a fairly, you know, within the last decade or two, is a fairly recent uh, discovery and uh, our better understanding of this phylogeny. Prior to this phylogeny being developed, it was thought that the venomous lizards, which are in this group helodermatidae, they had evolved their venom separately from the snakes, the serpentes. And not all snakes are venomous, but enough are that it appears to be a very ancient ancestral thing in snakes, and some of them have lost it or just very, very minimized it, and others have elaborated and evolved more toxic and more elaborate venom delivery systems. Okay, And so originally this was thought to be analogous, that is, convergent. But once this close relationship was discovered between the venomous lizards and the snakes, it caused people to begin to reevaluate. And this is really only over the last couple of decades, but what they realized is that per, it was potentially possible for uh, these uh, venomous systems to be homologous, to have come from a single common ancestor. So they began to look at this molecular level, but even before that, then they said, well, wait a minute. If we have venomous lizards here and venomous snakes, and there are other groups that are more closely related to venomous lizards, than they are to the snakes, perhaps they're venomous also. 
And sure enough, as they began looking in the iguanas and many species, uh, in just about every species of varanid, which are the monitor lizards, and in these anguiid lizards, they found examples of venom. And these were not as elaborate, and in some cases not as toxic, but they're certainly there. And so we recognize today the um, Komodo dragon, for instance, is venomous, and it creates uh, toxins in its saliva that it grinds into its prey, and then it sits back and, and wait for its prey to expire. So this led to this idea that, okay, this venom system is homologous or evolved once in an ancestor, and then was elaborated on in the serpents, and maybe even some elaboration, but it's not nearly as complex or as advanced, I guess you might say, in the venomous lizards. Okay, So that's the take-home message. This reevaluation of our phylogeny caused us to reevaluate and find new phenotypes that had just kind of gone under the radar for a long time. So let's finish up and talk a little bit more about the morphology and some of the things that we see there, and then we'll look at the molecules. Now, in some ways, uh, saliva is kind of an ideal system for the evolution and diversification of venom systems. In fact, you might say it is pre-adapted to the evolution of venoms, and there are two reasons for that, and it turns out that both of them play a role in the evolution of the venom. So pre-adapted means that we have some features of a, of, of a structure or a group of molecules or something that are already kind of in the ballpark of what their eventual form will evolve into. And so um, in two ways, and let's elaborate or let's uh, enumerate those two ways. Number one. The salivary glands are these sec secretory glands, right? They secrete substances into the, the mouth cavity, um, but they are very good at creating a large number of, of proteins and then pushing those out of the cell wall, of cell body, getting rid of them and getting them out. So that's the first thing, right? They they're kind of already have, if not a very sophisticated, at least a rudimentary delivery system. And then secondly, many of the proteins that are created in the, sal in the salivary glands are designed to help pre-digest or begin the breakdown process for food. And so we might have some of the um, physical properties of those molecules that are already kind of in line with what we need a venom to do. So for those two reasons, we have kind of a, a perfect uh, area to begin to evolve venoms in the salivary glands. Okay? Uh, we'll look at some convergence in molecular form later, but I want to talk about convergence among um, the morphology also. And it's just interesting and provides a background. You should know it, but really we're going to focus and spend a little bit more time on the molecular side. So the most highly evolved venom delivery systems are in the vipers. Uh, there are many, many species of vipers, rattlesnakes, uh, cottonmouths, um, copperheads in the U.S. are all the ones that you may be familiar with, but they're part of that viper family. And in the viper family, they have these hinged front fangs that are very, very long, so they're tucked away when they're not being used, and they're hollow and have a very efficient venom delivery system and often can develop, de deliver fairly large quantities of venom. And so not only is the toxin a problem, but the amount of delivery is a problem, and so they can be quite dangerous. Um, and again, they're used both offensively for uh, attacking their food, but they can also be used defensively when the snake is threatened. Now, these other lineages are, are primarily venomous. The uh, colubrids have some really venomous and some that, that really aren't venomous at all. And then other snakes have lost or at least greatly, greatly reduced the venom that they produced. And then we have, of course, the, the quote-unquote lizards up here. So the elapids, there's a little bit of convergence in some lineages. The elapids have much smaller fangs. So cobras, and there are other members of this group, uh, coral snakes in the U.S., but they have much smaller fangs, but they still have a hollow fang delivery system. They're just not hinged. And so we do have this idea of hollow. And so we have a wide range, and we can see some of the steps along the way towards this most advanced viper form, where some snakes just have kind of reinforced teeth, and the uh, uh, venom is just kind of put in as the teeth make wounds. And there's no injection system, right? So that's what we have here. Others have a hollow groove to help move and then the, the proteins in the saliva are channeled down that. But sorry, I say hollow groove. It's not hollow, really. It's just a groove down there to help. Here's another example in a different lineage to help delivery. And then, of course, we have the hollow fangs that are much like a hypodermic needle with muscular injection, uh, just like a, a hypodermic needle. 
And so we do have some levels of morphological convergence in the um, forms of delivery that we see. Okay, so now let's take a look in more detail at the uh, molecular side of this. So it turns out that as you look across the venoms, there's a very, very wide array of different proteins that are used in the venoms. And there are some proteins that just as, you know, salivary proteins may be somewhat pre-adapted, there are other proteins that are pre-adapted. So it turns out that there are many metabolic processes that require you to break down tissue so that you can, you know, rebuild after an injury or that require, that have some sort of a uh, metabolic impact that, that if expanded upon or, or in larger doses could be a very bad thing. And so digestive enzymes are a really good one, the things that are created in the liver or in the pancreas and then pushed out into the digestive tract to break down proteins. So all of those are good candidates for um, uh, potential venoms. And so as we look across the wide range of proteins in snakes and lizards that are used for venoms, we see a, a vast array. In fact, I think they say there are 24, I believe was the number, somewhere in that neighborhood, a couple dozen different types of proteins that are used as venoms. And where they are originally or also co-expressed gives us some indication. And some of them are a little bit unusual, like we have BNP that is also expressed in the heart. But many of them, you notice, have a digestive or other exocrine function, pancreas, kidneys, um, in the liver. Um, some others are uh, involved in uh, small amounts in, in other tissues, but then in large amounts can be quite dangerous. Um, and so we have two basic patterns that are going on here. The first is a good vocabulary word, one that you should know, called gene recruitment. And gene recruitment, or sometimes it's also co called co-option, is where a gene gains a second function. So it's used in one sort of a tissue, but then some mutation causes it to also be expressed, maybe at a higher level, in a second tissue. So if we have a gene that is only being used in the liver, but then suddenly there is a mutational event so that it can be turned on and used in um, the salivary glands also, then suddenly you might have a slightly more toxic uh, venom, and that can be a huge advantage for these uh, predatory organisms. So when a gene becomes recruited and gains a second function, it by definition is now pleiotropic. So pleiotropy is where one gene has two jobs. So in essence, this gene recruitment is what creates pleiotropy. And so now we have this interesting dynamic where we have a one gene that's doing two different things, or at least maybe not completely different, right? Because they may be related. We might have digestion of tissue uh, in a uh, lumen, right, inside of a stomach or a small intestine or something, and we might have digestion of prey tissue when it's in injected. So one of the primary uh, uh, actions of viper venom, like rattlesnakes, for instance, is it starts to break down and di essentially digest uh, muscle tissue, and that's one of the reasons why they, those are very, very painful bites. Others target um, nerve tissue or other targets, and so there can be multiple targets here. Not only that, but there's some really interesting natural selection um, that is going on uh, based on what type of prey, right? So uh, if we have one specific type of prey, then evolution may occur to make uh, those venoms very, very toxic for that prey. And other uh, organisms may suffer much less, or maybe even not at all, when they are exposed to those venoms. So we can get highly specialized uh, venoms. And the animals that are most dangerous for humans, now humans are not the primary prey target, in fact, not really anymore, any prey target, maybe historically, right, we were prey for uh, large vertebrate carnivores. Uh, but we're not the, the, the primary prey item for uh, snakes or any other venomous organism. But if we come in contact and the, the venom gets into us accidentally or defensively, right, if a snake is defending itself because it feels threatened, or if we are uh, stabbed by a, um, a cone shell, uh, which is a type of a mollusk, those are dangerous to us because those uh, organisms are targeting vertebrate prey, right? Mice metabolically and, and physi uh, physiologically are not that different from humans. So if something kills a mouse, there's a good chance it will be dangerous for humans too. And with the um, some of the most toxin are these cone, cone uh, snails. Cone, I think they're called cone snails is the most common term for them. But these cone snails are uh, fish uh, uh, predators. They target fish 
and that's a vertebrate it's close enough to us that many of those venoms that are great for the fish also are dangerous for us and so those are the ones that we need to be aware of now in snakes many 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 different fa factors some of which you might even be familiar with i don't expect you to memorize them or learn any of them but just know that there are a couple of dozen different uh, distinct types of proteins that have all been recruited for venom and the vast majority of them actually were not originally part of the um, salivary glands so the way that they did this in the fry paper uh, which is uh, one of your reading assignments is that they um, looked at the closest relative the closest molecular relative right the closest gene to uh, a group of uh, proteins that acted as a venom and in not every case because in some cases evolution uh, of those venoms and probably selection on those venoms was so fast that there was not a clear closest relative but in many cases, they were able to identify the closest genetic relative of that subcategory of venoms. And so these are the ones that they were able to identify and where those genes were expressed. So notice most of them come from other parts of the body. However, there are a couple um, that are interesting. The calicrin, which are originally look like they are came from the salivary glands and this group that are called CRISP uh, that's a acronym many genes are named have funny names or acronym names but CRISP also was originally a salivary but they're used in other exocrine functions also so two out of the 20 or so that they were able to identify a closest relative to came from the salivary gland so they were modified not really co-opted just modified and maybe becoming more um, venomous or more toxic um, but the rest were then brought in uh, and recruited from other tissues. And so that means that they have two functions. And so when a gene has two different functions, when a gene is pleiotropic, there's this interesting interplay between constraint and lability or flexibility, right, in the way that they can evolve. Now, they are constrained because as long as that gene is pleiotropic, it still has two distinct jobs. And so we may not be able to evolve too much additional toxicity uh, when it's been recruited as a venom, because if that toxicity evolves too far, then perhaps it will have a very negative impact on its other pleiotropic function. And so it's going to be constrained that way. And so more commonly, we might see a evolution of a gene that's pleiotropic so that um, it's just expressed in really, really, really large amounts. So we might need a lot of it in the venom to have its negative impact. Or sometimes if it's just taken in the wrong place. Many of these genes are very tightly controlled in the area where they are allowed to do their work and in, in different uh, amounts. And so either amount or a change in the location of where those, those proteins are located can have the venomous impact. But then we still have this now. We have kind of a competing force that might allow for some movement and some flexibility. Now, if we wanted to remove all of the constraint right from this gene that has two jobs there's one way that that could be done and you're already familiar with that so think about it how could we remove the constraint of pleiotropy and the answer would be a gene duplication event so then if we have two copies of the gene and then perhaps further a selection of mutations uh, one of those copies could maintain its old ancestral function say in the liver or the heart or wherever and the other one could then be expressed in the venom and then it would be much more free to evolve, increase toxicity, and it can, it can move along. So gene duplication basically removes much of the constraint that is present in these genes that have been co-opted and become pleiotropic. Okay? And so a protein acting as a venom does not need to take on a new function. Many of them were recruited because they were already pre-adapted for a digestive function or an um, interruption of... Um, neurological signal or some other thing that's just there are many ways that uh, something can be toxic so they are already somewhat pre-adapted for venom so it might just be an, an, a question of amount rather than taking on a brand new function but in some cases they do clearly take on brand new functions and so to finish up we'll look at one example where a protein this is a different one so this is we're going to now step away from snakes and lizards but this is looking at some levels of convergence that have occurred in a group of genes called chitinases and these are also used as venoms but in different organisms so in a parasitoid wasp which injects its eggs into arthropod hosts and an octopus which hunts uh, other arthropod sorry octopus is not an arthropod but it hunts arthropods so crabs primarily or shrimp and both the octopus and the wasp 
has developed a chitinase that is acting as a toxin, so essentially it's a venom. It's injected either through the beak in the octopus or through the ovipositor of the uh, parasitoid wasp, and it helps to digest chitin, which is the primary uh, component of the exoskeleton in arthropods. And there's this paper, it's, it's uh, also by the same author, I didn't assign it, you don't need to read it, but it's an interesting one because there's so some levels of convergence between these uh, organisms uh, that are so widely divergent but are yet needing this protein to act in a similar way. And so we can see convergence when there is a common um, function, whether it's been recruited for that or it was its original function, but when we see a common function, often convergence at the molecular level will result, and we can see that when we analyze these DNA sequences from these organisms.